Please stand if you're able. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with a the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go, Wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and, mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go Siloam, to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. That was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I say. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know this, that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to the, be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, 
I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt, but now that you say, we see, your guilt removed, remains. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you, from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon for this morning comes from our Gospel reading, specifically the verses 35 to 41. I've entitled it, Open the Eyes of Our Hearts. See if you've had this experience in your life. You wake up, it's like the other morning. You didn't expect it to snow, but there snow is. Snow on your car, snow on the sidewalk. If you got up early enough, there's snow on the road. Now you're running late. You didn't expect to have to do this. You're in a hurry. You're trying to get ready fast, and you need to get out there. You need to get that car started to warm it up. You need it to get the snow off of it. And even if it's in the garage, you need to get it warmed up so that the windshield doesn't fog over or flee, freeze. So where are your keys? They're not there. They should be right here. This is where I always put them on the dresser. They're always right here. Where are they? Not there. So you start looking all over the house, any place they might be. Where was I last night before I went to bed? They're not here. They're not there. They're not there. If you have a spouse, you go in and ask your spouse, have you seen my keys? They say no. But then in the back of your mind, you're thinking, Maybe it is their fault. Maybe they did take them and put them somewhere. 
Sometimes I would stop and pray. To be honest with you, sometimes I don't. But it doesn't matter. All of a sudden, I take another look, and there they are. They are right on that dresser. Maybe moved a little bit from where I normally look. Maybe there was a piece of paper covering them over. But they're there. They were right in front of me. I just couldn't see it. I couldn't see the obvious. I was blind to it. You ever had this happen with your phone? You can't find your phone? Yeah. Yep. You set it down, don't know where it is. I have to go have somebody. We don't have a, a home line. We just have two cells. I have to have Susan or somebody else call it so I can hear it ringing. And where do you find it? It's right there on the bed with all of the stuff I wanted to take out to the car. It's right there. I just couldn't see it. I was blind to the obvious. That is the case over and over again in our gospel reading. The characters that we see, many of them are blind to what should be right in front of them, blind to what is obvious. We start off with the disciples. Jesus is traveling through, walking through Jerusalem. The disciples are with him. They encounter a man who has been born blind since birth, resorting to begging because he can't work, because he can't see. Imagine what that would be like not only to not be able to work, but to have to rely on the grace and mercy and gifts of other people, to have to be a beggar. Do you imagine there were some people that got kind of frustrated with him? Maybe tried to avoid him? Maybe said, ah, here you go. Not really wanting to give him anything. What it would like to feel to have to rely on other people? What it would be like not to see some of the things we take for granted? Like the sunrise in the morning, the snow that glistens off the mountains, the starry sky at night, or not even to be able to see the face of your mom and dad. These things pass right over the head of the disciples. You know what they do? They want to use him as an object of a theological discussion. They want to stand there in front of the guy and talk about him in the third person. Now, I don't know how close they were to him, but keep in mind, people that don't have vision, the other senses increase, like hearing. So right in front of this guy, hey, Jesus, what's up with this dude here? Why is he born blind from birth? Was it a sin that he did? And maybe in the back of their mind, they're thinking, well, blind from birth? When did he sin? If he was blind before he was born. Or Jesus, was it this? Is this the reason why he is blind? Did his parents do some kind of sin? But then when we read Ezekiel, Ezekiel promises us that we each suffer for our own sin. The sons don't suffer for the sins of the father. So help us out with Jesus. Why is this man born blind? Forget that he's been, the situation that he's been blind in. Forget about helping him with anything. Let's just talk about him. They are blind to his need, blind to who he really is. But Jesus isn't. Jesus is not going to use this as a theological discussion about this man in the third person. He does use it to correct some blindness in the disciples' life. Why do bad things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Sometimes there are consequences for our sin, but when we look at the plight of somebody who's born blind or somebody that's poor or somebody that lost their job or somebody that's in trouble, sometimes it's just the result of us living in a sinful, broken world where things don't work like they should. Without the Lord's word, it's hard for us to judge why things like this happen, but Jesus has another important point. Why was this man born blind? so that the grace and mercy and glory of God could be shown to him right at this very instant. And Jesus describes or shows him what that is when he heals him. He restores the man's sight. And think about what he's using. He's using very simple means, everyday means. How much more common can you get than dirt on the ground? Scoops up dirt from the ground, adds saliva to it to make it mud, puts it on the man's eyes, and tells him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which actually translated from the Hebrew means sent. 
It actually comes pretty close to the Greek word for apostle, one commissioned, one sent. Jesus sent him to this pool for a very good reason. I don't know how far away it was. Authorities think that it was in the north or the southeast corner of Jerusalem. But there's this. What did the man do? He did it. He got up and did it. Didn't know what would happen. Doesn't really know who this man is in front of him. But this man has been given something Faith to believe that if he follows Jesus' instructions, something good might happen. And lo and behold, it does. His sight is completely restored. Now, we're not really told what happens after that. Most Bible scholars think, well, what would you do if you had your sight restored? You'd go home. You'd tell your family. There'd be great, joyous, there should be a great, big, joyous party. But what does this man encounter? The people that he encounters, his neighbors and his friends, instead of having a great big party and rejoicing, they want to have a discussion about what happened. How could this be? They knew him. They knew that this man had been born blind. They had seen him begging, maybe even contributed money, and now all of a sudden there's the discussion, is he really who he says he is? Some say yes, but others are blind to the obvious. They know this man. He talks like this man. He's dressed in the clothes of this man. He lives in the house of this man, yet it can't be him. You know what it's got to be? Miracles like this don't just happen. It's, he's got to be somebody that looks like that man. What kind of blindness is that? Refusal to admit the obvious. You can't see the obvious. Hearts blinded to the obvious, to the work of God in this man's life, to the work of Jesus in this man's life. Well, there's division among the neighbors. Some say he is the man, some say he isn't. The big question is, is how did this happen? The man tells him, this man Jesus smeared saliva or mud on my eyes. I went and washed and I see. So because of this division, and they can't really make heads or tails of it, they take him to the religious experts, the Pharisees. Now there's more going on here than just wanting the answer of how this could happen. It's who did it. What does this mean about who Jesus is? Jesus has done something that only God could do. And if that's the case, could Jesus be the Messiah sent from God? Well, we need to go ask the experts. So they go and ask the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the learned ones. They know Scripture. They know the promise. They've read over and over again in Isaiah and other places that the Messiah comes. One of the things he'll do is he'll give sight to the blind. Here it's happened. But they can't see it. They don't want to see it. They don't want to believe it. How did this happen, young man? A man smeared saliva mud on my eyes and I see. Well, how can that be? There's a problem because it's Jesus. And as we learn, they already don't like Jesus. They have made this agreement among themselves, the Pharisees. If anybody confesses Jesus to be the Messiah, we're going to kick him out of the synagogue. It can't be Jesus that did this. It can't be Jesus working through the power of God. It just can't be. But they come across this. Hey, what day did this happen? Ah, it happened on the Sabbath. Yeah. Well, there you go. Jesus isn't some holy man. He's a sinner. He's a lawbreaker. He breaks the Sabbath by working on it. Forget the fact that the work Jesus did was not for himself. That it was a loving work for somebody who had been blind for birth. Forget all that. We can hang that on Jesus. So they turn and ask the man, okay, who do you say he is? Because some of the Pharisees are obvious. The obvious thing is there. The man was blind, now he sees. A miracle happened. Jesus was there and did it. He's got to be working for the power of God, and other men say, no, he can't be. He's a sinner, he's a lawbreaker. So with the impasse with the Pharisees, they turn to the man who was blind. What do you say? And he tells the Pharisees what they don't want to hear. He's a prophet. That means he's sent from God. And they don't want him to be that. Well, the only thing left to do is discredit who this man is. 
We need to prove that this man really wasn't blind from birth. This is a sham created by Jesus and the disciples. Call the man's parents. So they come. They can't lie. They know this is their son. They know he was blind from birth. And it's obvious that he sees. They should be the ones that give confession to this spiritual reality that's there, that Jesus healed and he's doing the work of God. Yet they're afraid. They're afraid because if they're kicked out of the synagogue, they'll be kicked out of society. They opt for, we don't know. It's crazy, man. Ask him. Ask our son. He's old enough. Well, that puts it in the hands of the man again. They summon him back. Tell him, give glory to God. In other words, tell the truth. Glorify God by telling the truth. Admit with us, this man is a sinner, is he not? But the man has spiritual insight that these learned Pharisees don't have and can't have because they lack the faith to have it. In some wonderful words, the man responds, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. Does that ring a bell from the hymn you just sang? There's no denying that. And what should that mean? Jesus did it. He's working with the power of God. It's undeniable. The Pharisees say, no. There's no way it can be him. You're crazy. You're a fool. You're a disciple of his. You're a disciple and a follower of a sinner. We're disciples of Moses. We follow the law. This man breaks the law. But this unlearned, formerly blind man is not done. He continues on teaching these learned Pharisees. How did this happen? Tell us the truth. He says, I told you already. And you weren't listening. Why are you asking me again? Do you want to become his disciple? Now this man, there's a little dig. A dig I'd be proud to say. He knows how they feel about being Jesus' disciple. But after all, why do you keep asking me again? Why are you denying what's the obvious truth? Why do you deny the obvious truth about this man, Jesus? Well, you can imagine the reaction from the Pharisees. Now they're irate. Now they verbally abuse him. They call him names. They're getting serious about it. They say, we know that God doesn't listen to sinners. Actually, the man says this in response to the Pharisees. You may say he's a sinner, but listen to this. You should know this as a spiritual fact. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anybody is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens. God listens to Jesus. How can Jesus be a sinner? Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. Yet here it has happened now to me. Never. None of the prophets that came before, none of the people that faithfully serve God have ever done something like this. Here's Jesus doing clearly God stuff. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Meaning he must be from God. Pharisees, open your blind eyes to see what is right in front of you about who Jesus is. What happens? They cast him out of the temple. They cast him out of the synagogue. They can't face the reality. The best thing to do is get rid of this man, forget it ever happened. They kick him out. Not only is he kicked out of the synagogue, he's kicked out of society. He's one of the lost cases. Jesus hears that they kicked him out. Jesus comes and finds him. Came to the man first and healed him, now comes again to do a greater healing, a greater miracle on this man's life. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, found him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Son of Man was a phrase that Jesus often used instead of Messiah. Messiah had political overtones. Messiah made people think about somebody who will conquer the Romans. Son of Man harkens back to Daniel. To the Son of Man who came before the Agent of Days and was given an eternal kingdom to rule. That's him. 
That's Jesus. Coming before God, the Father, in a way no other human can, but definitely a human, because he's more than human, he is God. Tell me, young man, do you believe in the Messiah? Do you believe in the Son of Man that was promised? He answered, who is he, sir, that I may believe? Yes, I'd love to, but who is he? Now comes the turning point. You have seen him, and it is he who's speaking to you. It is me. I am the Messiah. The pure gospel from the Savior's lips. The power of God to change hearts and minds. The power to open the spiritual eyes of this man to see a truth that he hadn't completely seen before. How does he respond? Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus has opened this man's spiritual eyes. This man sees Jesus not just as a healer, but as a Lord and Savior. And not just the Lord and Savior of everybody, but his Lord and Savior. Jesus came to do that for him. He came to do that for you. He came to do that for me. That's why he went to the cross. Each of us has the same spiritual blindness as the Pharisees, the unbelief in our heart. Without the work of Christ, we could never see him as our Lord and Savior. But on the cross, he took from us that sinful unbelief, that sinfulness in our heart, that sinful nature that refuses to hear the gospel. He took it, he took it away, he removed it forever by dying and suffering on the cross in its place gives to us the power of faith through the Holy Spirit. God, once again, coming to us to give us the power to hold on to Jesus, not just in his death, but what happened after that, his resurrection, and what that means for us. We've been given a new heart and a new life, new spiritual eyes to see him as our Lord and Savior now, to see him as the one who earned for us what we could never earn, eternal life itself. It's the miracle of conversion. Happened in your life. Perhaps in your baptism when the Holy Spirit came and was poured into your heart and mind. Perhaps it was when you heard the gospel preached by somebody. Jesus came to that man to do that wonderful, miraculous work of conversion. He came to you. He came to me. I never chose to believe in Jesus. But he came into my heart and opened my spiritual eyes to see him for who he truly was. My Lord and Savior who loved me at a time when I didn't love myself. That's Jesus working. To this day, he continues to work. He continues to work through the word and the sacrament. He comes to us and presents himself over and over again. I am your Lord and Savior. Yes, you've sinned, but I welcome you back to me. I died to forgive that. Open your spiritual eyes to see. Yes, your sin is terrible. It's horrible, but I've forgiven it. It's gone. It's no longer on your record. You are forgiven and made a child of God. And I come continually through your baptism, through the word preached, through the sacrament to make sure you remain my precious children that we remain in a love relationship. Jesus came to do that for you, for me, for this blind man. He came even for those Pharisees. That's how powerful his work is. Those very Pharisees that refused to believe, we're told after Jesus' resurrection, many of them came around, came to faith, because the Holy Spirit can work in anyone's hearts. Mine, yours, even those people you run into in your life who you think could never be saved. Just like the disciples and the Pharisees thought this man was a lost cause, we sometimes think that, but the Holy Spirit can work in anyone's life. And he does that through the wonderful gift you've received, the gospel. As we play that out, as we continue to forgive others as God has forgiven us, as we continue to love others as God has loved us, the Holy Spirit works to open their spiritual eyes to who Jesus really is. 
Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. We need it every day. Sin comes into my life and it obscures who God is. It obscures how he wants me to live. But the Spirit comes and shows me in the law how wrong I am, points me back to Christ on the cross, reminds me of what he's done for me. He may not have opened my spiritual eye, my physical eyes. I may still need glasses, but that'll change in the eternal life to come. But he's opened my eyes to who he is and keeps opening them. Every time I turn away, he does that miracle of conversion, turns me back to him. May that work continue in your life, through the gospel, through the sacraments, keeping and holding you close so that in eternal life you'll see him truly for who he really is in all his glory, and you'll see it reflected in your perfect bodies and perfect souls. May that be your future and mine. Amen.